come loose. I've got the handlebars. Oh no. Steer a snap. Fucking engineers. Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now before you bitch to me about the wind noise, I've got one day off to do this. I can't predict the weather. I'll leave all the other video links in the description, but to introduce the protocol back in the first instance, we did the bit of fun video, which is which cadence is the most aero. But since then we've been looking at some far more serious topics and myth busting topics like, can this dual carbon anal hook be used as a handlebar and are rim brakes finally in the coffin? Seeing as I've been aero testing so many wheels, different wheels on the same control tire, which is the GP5K 28 millimeter, not sponsored, could really do with continental sponsorship for this. I thought I'd try the 32 mil tires. It's taken quite a while to get them because everyone's been out of stock, but seeing as a lot of rims now are so wide, is there really an aero penalty to the 32 millimeter tire? So that's what I'm gonna test in this video. Some say I can actually detect airspeed and dynamic air pressure on my cheeks. We're gonna use the AeroLab sensor, so thanks to those guys for supplying the pitot tube. And whether we like it or not, all modern rims are getting wider. So 21 millimeters internal is kind of like normal now. Uh, I'd say that's on the minimum end actually, and externally we're looking at 30 to 35 millimeters wide. Now I certainly am a fan of the wider tires, just for their versatility and the all-road capability and the different types of riding you can do just by changing the tire pressure without having to change the tires every time you go from sort of an all-road slash gravel ride to a faster road. However, now forgive me for looking at my script, I want to put this kind of succinctly and concisely as possible. A common myth or marketing lie is that wider tires always have a lower rolling resistance, and that is a very very misleading statement. Without treading on the toes of an upcoming video, rolling resistances of the same compound tires in different widths are the same once you adjust pressures to match the comfort level and vibration attenuation. We'll address that in the upcoming video where we'll discretize rolling resistance into its component parts, which is frictional losses from the rubber on a molecular level and vibration attenuation or suspension losses of the bike and rider system. Now, naively, we may just consider the former being just the frictional losses of the rubber now, that's the kind of data you'll find on bicyclerollingresistance.com. Their work has been really, really good. Um, I'd say it's pretty valid, but it only looks into the frictional losses in the tyre itself. It doesn't look into suspension losses. Now, honestly, I just want to say this without going into that video too much. The difference between a fast tyre and a slow tyre is night and day. So all these like minute aero differences we're exploring between handlebars and wheels. The first thing you can do, the lowest hanging fruit, is buy a, a fast tyre, and it's the best value upgrade you can do. Now, at the end of summer, I created a CRR map, a rolling resistance map, to find the optimum control pressure for my weight on this course on the 28mm Conti GP5K, which I'll explain briefly here. Welcome back, diary number five, and what we'll be doing today, we're fixing CDA. Now, why would I come out to fix CDA when I'm actually, I've got a CDA sensor? Well, I'm trying to get a good map of CRR, which is coefficient of rolling resistance. Now, if I fix CDA with a known CDA, and do repeat runs without changing position or wheels at different tire pressures, I can get a CRR map. Now that control pressure which that test found, which we settled on, was 76 PSI, and you may think that sounds low for my weight. Now that's the beauty of making a rolling resistance map at constant CDA on a certain course. You can literally find the best, the fastest tire pressure, which is a mix of the frictional losses in the tire and the vibration attenuation. So that comes down to this road surface and how much vibration is going into my body. The physics don't lie, and the Peak Talk Physics Don't Lie t-shirts will be coming very soon. For a fair test, we're going to fix comfort and thus rolling resistance and purely do an aero test. So for this, we need to adjust down the pressure of the big a tire to match the hoop stress of the smaller tire which is a function of the measured diameter of the tire and the wall thickness of the tread simplifying the hoop stress equation we'll put it on screen somewhere here or here we get p2 equals p1 d1 over d2 so that is the pressure of the skinnier tire times the diameter of the skinnier tire divided by the diameter the measured diameter of the bigger tire wall thickness part of the equation cancels out because the measured tread thickness of the 28 and the 32 gp5k is exactly the same and i verified that so i'm going to set the chunkier tires to 66 psi so I'm going to do five laps on the 32s on the Polaris 42 wheel set, which is under test at the moment. And I'm going to do five laps on the 28s on a control wheel set. Now I have got the car just down there on the strip because I'm going to be out here for a fair time. Doing it on a control wheel set will help me kind of normalize the results against other days a little bit, but we're just going to mainly focus on today. And then I'm going to put the 28s back on the P42s, the Polaris P42s to get a real light for light comparison against the first test. For these tests, I'm going to be riding at about 280 watts 
uh, which is going to see me going along about 36 k's an hour on the hood and I can stay in a very constant and relaxed position at that speed and power. As I mentioned in the last video, I could go faster to improve the resolution of the data but that's going to introduce more error, more random error, because as I fatigue, I'm not Philip Pagano, I can't ride along at 50 k's an hour for 30 k. I'm going to start to like move all over the place, my arms are going to go out, my head's going to drop, and my CDA error is just going to go up. So it's a balance between resolution and keeping that CDA error between the laps as small as possible. So with all the fucking about changing tyres, adjusting brakes and everything, I reckon I'm going to be out for about two and a half hours. So I'd best get cracking. Right, so thanks for sticking around. All the runs are done now. Put the little gilet back on. I don't want to ride in the gilet because it can flap around a bit. It's going to make the CDA kind of a little bit noisy. So I took that off. Once the pressure is adjusted on the 28s versus the 32s, I just couldn't notice any difference. They felt exactly the same. Obviously the same comfort because we adjusted that with the hoop stress. But is there an aero penalty? Let's get inside, take a look at the data and all will be revealed. So you're very familiar with this graphical format, I hope. By now we've got CDA on the primary vertical axis on the left over here. We've got lap number along the bottom, five laps on each, and the average yaw for each lap on the secondary vertical axis on the right hand side. Now a quick note on that, the beauty of using the Aerolab Pitot tube sensor is that when it does the CDA calculation, all the barometrics of that run and that test are accounted for. So even if the wind, speed, direction, air pressure and density changes slightly, that doesn't really matter. It all comes out in the wash when calculating CDA. So you can see here that the, the yaw for every run is pretty much around the same. We had between kind of seven and 10 degrees of yaw for all the tests, which is quite a narrow range. We're quite happy with that for, for one day of testing. However, when you get into extreme yaw angles, the CD, the kind of drag coefficient regime can change. So it is pretty important to do it within a narrow window as you can. Four different combinations, like I said, on test, the two, the two different rims, uh, well, two different wheel sets and the two different tires. Let's concentrate on the yellow and pink lines, first of all, because that is the Polaris 42 millimeter wheel set, which I say is a very wide and shallow wheel set. And the difference between the 32 millimeter tire and the 28 millimeter tire on that wheel set is pretty much indistinguishable. Now that was quite a surprise, but I don't think you're really punished for the 32 mil tire on that wheel set because the wheel set is so wide. If the air isn't disturbed by the big tire, it's gonna be disturbed by the wide rim anyway. But actually, if you want the benefits of a wider tire on that wheel set, my testing has shown, um, you know, five laps on each, a very controlled 10 kilometers on each back-to-back -back tests. There is barely any difference in average CDA, and we'll come to the wattage differences in a minute. Now, you may think that statement is applicable to all shallow rims, and the really interesting result about this test is it's absolutely not. So the ICANN Aero 35 is a much narrower, kind of more traditional rim shape. It's still pretty wide at about 20 to 21 millimeters internal. I think I measured it at 20.5 internal, so not that much narrower than the P42 but it doesn't really bow out after that. It has a very flat kind of transition to the tire. And what we can see here is that the 28 millimeter tire performs much, much better on that rim. This is the dark green line, but the 32 mil tire you're really punished for on that rim because the rim is that little bit narrower. And the differences that these translate into in terms of wattage differences are quite marked actually. And just for understanding, I have actually plotted some approximate error bars on the CDA calculations. P42, the Polaris 42 wheel set, the differences between the two tire widths are pretty much within the errors for most of the, the, the data points apart from the last two. But for the ICANN sake on the narrow tire and the fat tire, the, the differences are actually pretty big and the resolution away from the error bar is quite good. So I'm pretty happy with the, the you know, conclusion of that, that on the ICANN, the wider tire, you're, you're really punished, but the, the narrower tire does really well. What does that mean in terms of a wattage saving at certain speeds. So this dotted white line here is the test speed. Um, the average test speed is between 35 and 36 k's an hour. And then these figures in this table are the actual error watts required to perform that speed. Now the error watts at the slower speed and the faster speeds, uh, 40 to 50 kilometers an hour are extrapolated. They're not actually tested but the data around 35 is pretty much bang on what was actually coming off the power meter after deducting the other losses. So we can see here that the P42 between the 32 and the 28, there's barely, I mean, that is within the error, as we said before. In actual fact, if you ignore the error, the 32 millimeter tire is actually slightly faster than the 28 on the P42. Now that may be because that rim is much, much wider. There's actually a better transition with the wider tire, 
But we can see the, the complete opposite is true when we go to the ICANN Aero 35, which is a much narrower rim. The 28 millimeter tire on that, which is denoted by the dark green line here, has a much lower power requirement, um, five and a half, six watts at 35 k's an hour, and that goes out to about 10 watts at 40 k's an hour. And that's just by changing the tire. And like I said, uh, going back to the previous graph, that is very repeatable, that trend. This is back to back, um, well away from the, the error magnitude on both of these, the two green lines. So that is, <laughs> it just goes to show, if you've got a narrow rim or a very specific width rim, that the tire width can really harm you in that case. Um, but if a slightly fatter rim, like the P42, there is no penalty for going up to a 32 mil tire. And I would say that rim really does suit a wider tyre at a lower pressure and quite marked results as you can see here. Now I've added another data point to this graph um, which you know the graph is entitled error watts but this is actually an extra CRR loss so I did the exact same test I had a bit more time that day I went back and got another wheel set took the tyres off that wheel set and put Vittoria Corsa Next 32mm tyres at the right pressure on the uh, Polaris 42 wheel set right and I did the test again, and the extra required wattage at 35 k's an hour was 19 watts. And I don't know at the moment whether that was an aero loss. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's not an aero loss because the, you know, the shape, the measured width of the tyre is exactly the same pretty much. I'm not sure the air knows really the aero difference between a 32 Vittoria Corsa X and a 32 uh, GP5K. But the extra CRR loss from frictional losses in that tire is absolutely huge. And that goes back to what I said at the start of the video. If you're going to make a uh, base choice about how to get faster on a bike for a performance, choose a fast rolling tire. That's a, it, it is a cheaper tire than GP5K, but the rolling resistance, the added rolling resistance, even at the control pressure for the 32 mil, um, is huge, about 19 watts for my weight and that speed. So that's 35 Ks an hour. And if you look on bicycleRollingResistance.com at that data for that tire, this does kind of tally up because I'm a lot heavier than their system weight. My system weight is just over 100 kilos and I'm testing it slightly faster. And between the two tires, the total extra CRR loss is about 19 watts. Now, like I said, this isn't an aero watts, so I can't really plot the whole line. I only tested it at one speed, but wow. <laughs> the rolling resistance difference between different rubber compounds dwarfs you know the magnitudes of these differences between the aero um, benefits of different rims and different tires so if there's one thing you're going to do get a fast tire just briefly why do i think the wider tire on the ican aero was penalized so much well as you can see here from this bit of b-roll footage of the ican aero 35 uh, and the 28 mil tire, that transition between the sidewall to the rim is probably one of the flattest, best transitions I've seen on any rim on any bike ever. It's a very cheap rim and a very cheap wheel set. I've got a review of that on my channel if you want to go and see it. But in terms of, I, mean, I don't know if they did it by design or not, but the transition of that 28 tire to that rim is absolutely perfect. When you scale up to a 32 mil tire, you've got the big light bulb effect. And I think the air, because the rim is so shallow, the air is never going to reattach to the rim. And as soon as it hits the front of the tire, I think you've lost any chance for attached flow. I hope that gives you a bit of an insight into kind of the aerodynamics of wider tires and helps you inform some kind of choices about what tires to fit on your rim. I would say if they've got a narrower rim, don't fit anything too wide if you're really worried about the aero, which is ironic really, because when people fit wider tires, they tend to fit them to, you know, lower profile rims because of crosswinds or bad roads or winter riding. And actually, then the shallower the rim, the more important the tire width becomes to the aerodynamics, just because there's no chance of it reattaching on such a shallow section if you've got the tire too fat. Thanks everyone for joining for this video. Let me know any comments or feedback you've got in the description below. And stay tuned for the next video where we're gonna do more kind of fixed CDA stuff and start varying the rolling resistance to try and optimize a tire for a certain course based on the frictional losses and the vibration attenuation. Cheers, and I'll see you in the next one.